Sacked by an app sounds like a quite good catchphrase, but not a good way to be sacked. Although it probably is no good way to be sacked, but I'd like, if I was sacked, and I have been, to know that it was a human being sacking me, not an app. And at Amazon, it's apps that sack you now. <coughs> Flex drivers, who are Amazon contract workers and not granted protections granted for full-time employees, are being hired and fired via an app. A software program monitors each worker to determine whether or not they are working quickly enough, whether they are driving safely enough, and whether they are efficiently meeting their delivery quotas. That this program is rife with errors and punishes workers for things that are not their fault, from traffic problems to incorrect delivery directions, does not seem to concern Amazon. Workers have often complained about the unfair monitoring and lack of human oversight, but Amazon has maintained its system. That is a bit worrying that an app might sack you for things that aren't your fault, like a traffic jam or incorrect directions. And it's such an obvious, glaring example of the process of dehumanization that happens at the business end of capitalism, the pinnacle of capitalism. When productivity is optimized, humanity is diminished. Look, human beings are regarded as somehow disposable and expendable, and it doesn't matter if one Amazon worker gets exhausted because there'll be another one along in a minute. It's not just that the lowest possible working jobs have become automated and taken over by AI and robots, but management itself, and what management, I suppose, indicates is that ideology has been taken over by the algorithm. No room for humanity, no room for discussion, no room for sympathy or empathy, and these are not inadvertent decisions, these are calculated decisions that are taken from observing data. Hold on a minute, don't really matter if we lose loads of workers because there's plenty more poor people where that came from. So in a sense, Amazon, for all its expertise and excellence, is expediating or expediting the kind of corrosion of our what were once considered our core and most important values. Sometimes when you get something delivered, do you sort of feel like that the exchange has been kind of stripped of all meaning? That when in your own life do you have time to look in the eyes of someone who's delivering something to your house and go, thank you? It's like the dehumanization takes place on a personal, social level. It's very hard now, living in this culture, to remember that within every single human being you meet is a divine spark of light, a soul, a history, a future, dreams, heartbreak, loss. All of those things are stripped away because we are becoming like the algorithms and managerial systems that manage us. So it's not just the fact that people that work for Amazon are being treated in an inhumane way. This pinnacle inhumanity is trickling down, becoming a kind of uh, immersive and enveloping experience for all of us. Our humanity is at stake. This article continues. The man who designed Amazon's warehouses has pretty much said that Amazon systems are set up to promote high employee turnover because longer term workers are more comfortable and less desperate to please. I suppose these corporations and tech titans that are now held up as emblems of success and triumph or just unthinkingly consumed and engaged are becoming the embodiment of the worst conceivable kind of values. It is like living out Skynet's prediction that, well, human beings, they don't help. We can kind of eliminate them. The thing that stops the system from working perfectly is human frailty. In the end, you do reach dystopic conclusions. If you don't, in a, in a sense, uh, valorize our um, values such as empathy, kindness, sympathy, then they get kind of extracted altogether. Mark Fisher has got some brilliant things to say about this in his book, Capitalist Realism. Deleuze and Guattari, the philosophers, describe capitalism as a kind of dark potentiality which haunted all previous social systems. Capital, they argue, is the unnameable thing, the abomination which primitive and feudal societies warded off in advance. When it actually arrives, capitalism brings with it the massive desacralization of culture. It is a system which is no longer governed by any transcendent law. On the contrary, it dismantles all such codes only to reinstall them on an ad hoc basis. The code, for example, that human beings are inherently valuable and worth protecting and honoring, if you strip that out and it's like, well, actually, you could just, if one driver don't work, 
get them out. You can have another driver along. If once you get let go of the value of a human being, then the machine can operate more efficiently. I think what we're experiencing now is the kind of amplified horror that occurs when this level of technical capability meets the rapacious appetites of capital. In an open letter to Jeff Bezos last year, Abe Collier wrote about his experience working as an Amazon delivery driver and the pressure put upon him during a work day. He had to intentionally dehydrate himself because of the lack of bathrooms, unrealistic expectations for speed of deliveries, hostility from passers-by, and physical strain. Collier also wanted to make it clear that he was grateful for the opportunity to be mistreated in this way. He wasn't eligible for unemployment benefits, and he wrote, due to the pandemic, I was desperate for any income. That gratitude was also behind the recent failure to unionize at an Amazon warehouse. Many workers spoke of being grateful for the work, as bad pay is better than no pay. So. I suppose we see here how the pandemic has been used to create desperation, despair and extreme need among working people so that they no longer feel that they have the power to mobilise, resist, organise or make demands of their employers. This I suppose is why the pandemic has precipitated the single biggest transfer of wealth from poor people to rich organisations in history. This also came from Fisher's book, Capitalist Realism. Capital is an abstract parasite, an insatiable vampire and zombie maker, but the living flesh it converts into dead labour is ours, and the zombies it makes are us. Think again of the way that we interact with one another, the way that we interact with people that are providing us with service, particularly if they are veiled in the logos and livery of corporate giants. You no longer see the human being that's present. We are becoming zombies living in an algorithm. Now those of you that think when I'm being anti-capitalist that I'm somehow a Russia today Marxist, let's all go Maoist and get proper into some old school communism, beware that I'm not saying the other option is state communism. No, big state also not a good idea. Localised power, localization, allowing each other to make decisions that affect our own lives. Now the way that this is prevented I suppose is by entombing us in the idea that we need some kind of sovereignty, whether it's apparently left or apparently right, to protect us from the horrors of the barbarians beyond the gate, whether those barbarians are pandemics or terrorists or, what, or communists or capitalists, whatever things being used this week to keep you in a state of desperation where at the extreme economic end of it you're willing to work for Amazon where you might be sacked at some point by an app, not even a human being, called Julie, nervously chewing a pen while they tell you, sorry, it's just not going to work out for you. You do take too long with your deliveries and you've been weeing in a bottle, which is weird and unforgivable. There was a reason I did that. There's no excuses here. From Mark Fisher again. Capitalist ideology in general, Zizek, Slavoj Zizek, the brilliant philosopher, capitalist ideology in general, Zizek maintains, consists precisely in the overvaluing of belief, in the sense of inner subjective attitude at the expense of the beliefs we exhibit and externalise in our behaviour. So long as we believe in our hearts that capitalism is bad, we are free to continue to participate in capitalist exchange. According to Zizek, Capitalism in general relies on this structure of disavowal. We believe that money is only a meaningless token of no intrinsic worth, yet we act as if it has holy value. I find myself doing that all the time. Moreover, this behaviour precisely depends upon the prior disavowal. We are able to fetishise money in our actions only because we've already taken an ironic distance towards money in our heads. One of the things that Mark Fisher was great at was pointing out that we require a kind of a new sincerity, a kind of zeal. We need to find again a, the kind of emotion that religion or indeed football can evoke so that not everything is inverted commas, not everything is distant, not everything is well I understand that you know this is wrong but we have to do it, it's just the system. But we need to renew our passion for potential change. We need a new kind of politics. If you're finding these Mark Fisher things a little difficult to comprehend, you'll love this one where he uses Wall-E, the Pixar movie, to unpack some of these ideas. A film like Wall-E exemplifies what Robert Faller has called interpassivity. The film performs our anti-capitalism for us, allowing us to 
continue to consume with impunity. I've said this to you before, films like that Lego movie, The Matrix, Wall-E, they're telling you it's bad. You're living in a mad illusory system. You're handing yourself over to a set of ideas that aren't real and allowing them to encode you with negative information and you're not even doing anything about it. All of us know this now. The pandemic has provided a kind of incubatory period where the wealth transfer and other weird corrupt stuff has gone on that's caused us to ask questions, but are we going to do anything about it? Are we going to continue to live atomized lives of interpassivity or are we going to become engaged and demand from whatever perspective the right to be treated as a human being with dignity? If you like that, please would you press like and subscribe and join up to my mailing list so I can monetize you. No, I mean, the fact is I've got to build a community somehow. And uh, let me know what you think of this video. If you want to listen to me having big, deep, hour-long chats, get my app from, oh, bloody hell, get Luminary from Apple. Look, I don't know how you're going to free yourself, but somehow you will. And also watch my Shakespeare show, Our Little Lives, streaming on live now. All the links for all of these monetized projects that I do are in the description. If you don't want to get involved, no one could be more sympathetic than I am. Let us use these tools to create a new kingdom, a new kingdom where these tools are rightly positioned in our service, not vice versa. Thank you.